landscape is, is a question of you know what you learn, how you apply it, and and you know, less than the single thing in my opinion. It's it's about the language, it's about developing the language, being able to understand what why things work the way they do, so that you can uh, hopefully you know apply certain you know, pictorial devices to the next problem that comes your way, uh, and you know and having a variety of, of choices to, to resolve problems, and that is something that there's no shortcut for that. You just need to pound that pavement for years and years and decades. And decades. Well, hey. you don't expect an artist showing up in a rainstorm and a uh, pandemic, but we've got one right here, right. Del thousand miles Alameda. Here. And Del, yeah, I'm thrilled to have you on today, yeah. So tell me, uh, you brought all these paintings. How long did it take you to do these paintings? Oh, I've been working on this series for uh, late January, early February, so yeah. you know, a month and a half, a little over that, six, six, seven weeks. And so if people are looking on YouTube, they can see actually in the shot, you'll see some of the paintings. We have two of them that he just brought in. Right. And, uh, you know, I just love your stuff. It's very unique and different. But I, what I really want to know, you're probably, I think, the only artist that I can think of that was born in a different country other than maybe Modolinsky. He was born in, uh, he was born in Europe, uh, Eastern Europe. But you came from Brazil, right? That's right. Well, so where did you grow up? I grew up in Sao Paulo. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it is the greatest city, as everyone says? Well, it's a great city. Uh, I, know it's, I, I was born in the city of Santos, which is the port city just uh, east of Sao Paulo, you know, 35 miles east. And so you know, I, my growing up was between Santos and Sao Paulo, a big city, which is uh, you know, the magnet for everybody who's in you know, the area. How big is Sao Paulo? The greater Sao Paulo is over 20 million. Jeez Louise. Yeah, the city yeah. proper is probably 10. I don't know, I'm guessing 10 million. It's uh, big. And what did your folks do there? My dad was a longshoreman. He's retired. All my, all the men in my family were longshoremen. I was <laughs> the, the kid with the with the pad of paper and the <laughs> pencil. <laughs> and uh, everybody looked at scans. said, what the heck is going on here? Yeah, I bet that. So as a little child, even as in like grade school, you were interested in art. You were making oh, art. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I took my time to make the decision. I, was, I waited until I was about five to make sure that I was, you know. Five years old. Yeah, yeah. mature enough to really <laughs> think forward. So, yeah, by then I kind of knew this this is what I wanted to do. The question was not what to do, but how to do it, how to get yes. away with doing it. Right? And so when you were just a little kid, you painted and drew and uh, the whole shebang? Yeah, well, painting, uh, what I had access to was watercolors. Yes. Right, so, you know, the, the extent to which you could call it painting was, you know, with, with uh, water media. But drawing was, you know, a constant friend from, from very early childhood. And did you have... Um, uh, a teacher or somebody in school that where you were going recognize your creativity and uh, that you were good at art? No, no, no. I was just very spontaneous, and I just was looking for sources and, and things. It was, uh, it was something that caught my attention very early on, and you know, stuck with me. So I was looking for ways to do it. So I'd get my my relatives to sit for me when I was five, six years old. To, really, for, for portrait drawing. And, so. and do you still have some of those? No, I don't. Not right. not that early. Yeah, yeah. I've got my notebooks. I I have a good deal of my notebooks from uh, from you know elementary school, and they're all illustrated. It's right? just paintings. Yeah, drawings. drawings yeah, yeah. Say. So yeah, my you know my my homework was half illustration, half homework. And I was always you know illustrating the things that I was working on. So and I still have those. So, yeah. Wow. And so in high school, did you take the art classes and that kind of thing? Um, yes and no. I um I. Was very fortunate in my uh, uh, what what's called gymnasium. It's from fifth to eighth grade to go into a, um, this school that was uh, that it was a special, different school. You had to actually uh, pass a test to be in, mm. and, and it was a, a vocational school, um, which was a, it was a state-run vocational school. And uh, in it, you could take uh, every six months you you chose a different shop, and I. I took uh, f uh, found uh, uh, foundry. Mm -hmm. uh, I took uh, bookmaking, and I took typography, and I took woodwork. And in foundry, if you wanted to be in the foundry shop, you had to take technical drawing, you know, because you, you needed to understand how you know you need to visualize mm -hmm. an object in three dimensions, uh, you know, uh, iso uh, 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 isometrically. Uh, 
So I was uh, doing isometric perspectives when I was 11 years old. You know, and I, I, and it's something, you know, if you get into something like that when you're 11, you're interested, it stays with you. And it's something that it's, you know, it's a, it's a type, type of uh, knowledge that uh, you learn to apply to anything. I subsequently went to college in Brazil. I studied uh, industrial design and then I went to architecture school. And I, you know, I, it was very easy for me to, to, to understand space because I had that sort of you know, opportunity in my formative years to, to, to learn how to negotiate uh, objects in, in two-dimensional uh, reduction. And that was called gymnasium? Yeah. And that went through what, French eight, system, eighth grade? Fifth grade, ga- grade yeah. And then Four so years. you get this training in a trade, basically, or yeah, that's right. in that. And yeah. then what happens after eighth grade? Oh, then you go into, a, into, college, into high school. Yes. Right. And yeah. did they have anything where you could also excel and do that kind of stuff? Yes. Well, the, the high school is the same, same school. Yes. Uh, and I studied, uh, actually, uh, I studied te- uh, electricity. Uh, hmm. uh, that was the, the, the field that I chose to go into. So the whole high school was geared toward becoming yeah. an electrician? Yeah. Four wow. years. Yeah. In a lot of ways, that totally makes sense, <laughs> you know, if you can find the interest that they have at that time. Yeah, and you had some options. I, I sort of, you know, I had I was talked into by by an older cousin who was studying architecture because what I wanted to do is there was a sort of architecture in preparation for architecture school course mm-hmm. that I could have chosen instead of electricity. And I was tempted to go into that, but this cousin of mine, whom I really looked up to, who was studying architecture, said, yeah, maybe you shouldn't do that. Maybe you should do this. Mm-hmm. And uh, because of various reasons in you know, the market, you know, I was trying to find ways of, you know, supporting myself and, you know, being able to... So I ended up getting, getting talked into studying that instead of uh, architecture. But, you know, after that, I ultimately ended up studying architecture in Brazil. And, you know, and then when I came to, to, to the California, I went to UC Davis and I studied art there. But, you know. And so, how long did you do architecture, and where was well, that? Well, I took I didn't finish the courses. I took uh, I took two years of industrial design, and then I switched to architecture. And I studied two years of architecture and, and urban planning, and then I this came. This is in Brazil, right? Yes, that's right. And then then I, I came to to California, and I uh, was accepted at UC Davis, and I took the did the four year course of uh, art studio at UC Davis. So, what did your dad think about all this? Well, um, it took a while. <laughs> yeah, I would think. yeah, because you know it's uh, it's totally so distant from their reality that you know uh, they really don't know what to make of it. You know, when you were a kid living in that, uh, all my cousins, not just my my father, my grandfathers on both sides, my uncles, my cousins, they all in the industry, which was you know it was a good job to be a, to be a, a longshoreman because they were unionized and they they made good money, but. You know, it's a, it's a rough bunch. You know, yeah, they're kid. tough, right? Look at uh, you know uh, on the waterfront. Yes, that yeah. was what I grew up in. It was like that, like that, except that it was in the seventies and the early eighties. Uh, in the eighties, I was born in sixty one, but you know, it was you know that if you compare how things evolved, it was kind of mm-hmm. like that then in, in the seventies as it was here in the fifties. Were you the only son? No, I'm the oldest of three boys. And what are the other two boys? Did they go into any? Of well, that? no, my my um, my uh, my mi- my second my, my the second child, he passed away. Mm. And my youngest brother is autistic. Mm. Yeah, he lives with my parents. Yeah, and he still does. Yeah. Yeah. And so your dad probably thought, hey, kid, this is a job. It's a great job. We've got inroads to it. Yeah. If all your uncles, your grandfathers. No, 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 no. It's not like he wanted me to do that. Yes. He did not want me to do that. Oh, he didn't? No, no. He wanted me to go to school and, you know, and... and be something else he really i would never you know i was always wanting to go to to work with him to go because he was he was uh, a specialist and he did cranes so mm. he was in yeah. the ship with the crane so yeah, he was a crane operator high, and that's highly specialized oh boy you don't know i mean yeah, yeah. sometimes I've you have two those guys you have two cranes working on the ship and they're picking up stuff on shore yeah and when when the load is picked up the the boat goes like this <laughs> and you got two of them yeah. so they they have to know where to drop that load this yeah, is it's a ballet Man, it's a very, very specialized, tricky thing. But I would never get to go with him because he wouldn't. He never let me get step into the ship with him yeah. because he really didn't want me to be part of that. He didn't oh, want me to move on and do something else. And what about architecture? Was that something he was like find a different? Oh no, he that that you know that he could see. Okay, now that's that's, that's a grown up. That's yeah. grown up yeah. stuff. <laughs> yes. uh, yeah. And then when you went to UC Davis, uh-huh. which was, you decided to go to art, right? Right. Now, what made you go from architecture 
to art. Something had to flip there. Well, you know, the architecture thing was a tricky part. Going to art was easy. The architecture, going to architecture was a question of survival. I had, it, had to find a way to, to bring together, to conflate my, my interests, my, my, my abilities with something that I could, uh, you know, use to, to, to make a living, to, you know, to, to have the affluence that would allow me to, to paint and to do things in my, my own way. So architecture was that kind of choice. Going into art, it was it was the obvious choice, but the more difficult outcome uh, uh, choice. So for your family, yeah, for uh, everyone involved. Yeah, your, your dad. Would, that's right. This is when your dad said, "What? What do you mean art?" Yeah, right. Well, that's, he's been saying that since I was five years old, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when you said, "I've done the architecture," I don't think this is what I really lo- love to do. I want to go right, to right, America. Yeah. Well, by Dan, you know, it's you know, it's it's out of his hands by by you know, by a long shot. Right? Yeah. So you're going to do it regardless. Yeah, I'm going to do it, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I did. I was, you know, I, once I, I graduated in 1990, and uh, through the 90s, I worked um, as an industrial, as a, not industrial, as a, as a uh, graphic designer, and I did web design, and I did, um, I did a lot of architectural renderings for architects because I, you know, I was good at uh, pulling, you know, perspectives out mm-hmm. of you know, planes and pla- plants and, and elevations, so I could do that, and it's something that. Not all architects are inclined or capable of doing. Particularly, the more the computer came in, came into the field, the, the less likely uh, you you know come out of architecture school with that kind of skill set. Yeah, what's a very hands-on thing? Yeah, what year did you go to UC Davis? From uh, 1987 to 1990. Okay, and you had did you get a degree in architecture as well? No, I did not. No, but no. you did. I dropped basically out of basically four years. Yeah, well, yeah. I did four years of industrial design, and then I transferred to architecture and urban urban planning. Two years, two years of each, two years of each, and yeah. then four years of art at UC Davis. And so, when you went to UC Davis, you worked with some pretty uh, outstanding people too, right? Oh yeah, it was it was a it was a pretty loaded. Uh, uh, program at the time. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you have Wayne yeah. Tebow, right? Wayne, we had uh, Ronald Peterson. Uh, Condos was there? No, Condos. Not yet. He was at the... Yeah, Condos was in Sacramento. He, he never taught at UC Davis. Yeah. Yeah, he was... How about Don Haggerty? Was, did you know Don? Yeah. He, he was an yeah. art... He was there, uh, and, uh, yeah, and, you know, uh, Roy the Forest, uh, mm. uh, yeah, so... It was a good group of old guys who had been there, and they were closing, all of them getting close to retiring. Mm. Uh, but they were there in the 90s and the 80s, for sure, and, and in the 90s. They, they began to retire, like Ron Peterson retired in 92. Uh, Wayne retired around that time, too. He was older than, is older than Roland, but he kept coming back. In fact, up until recently, I wouldn't be surprised if it... Uh, are about to turn on 100 this year. Right. He's still t- teaching that one um, art appreciation class seminary once uh-huh. a year. And both Peterson and uh, Tebow really affected you, right, in different ways. Oh, yeah. oh yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, talk, talk, talk to me about that. Really. Well, uh, Roland was was the, the person in there that I had the most, uh, uh, that I spent most time with because I, <clears throat> I took... Um, a lot of uh, printmaking with him mm. and uh, photography. I spent two years doing photography with him. He he studied with Minor White, not study. He worked with Minor White in the fifties in San Francisco. Mm. So he brought a lot of photography into into his you know into his bag, mm-hmm. and so that was that was uh, the ones the single most uh, formative thing for me uh, of all things. If I were to isolate one by itself, would have been the experience that I had with him in photography. And why is that? Well, because you know, when you when you're doing photography, uh, you learn to to understand uh, value, but you also learn to understand crop, cropping and composition. Mm. Composition is you know, especially photography as as he saw it, it was a critical part in in your critical thinking visually. Mm-hmm. So I had to really spend a lot of time trying to understand what it what it was about what is this vast array of visual information that interested me and was part of my uh, linear. Uh, un- un- attempt to understand my, my visual reality and isolate that and be able to, you know, parse that and and then control it to create a picture, right? Mm-hmm. And that's the same thing w- when you come to to, uh, to to these paintings because ultimately they are um, it's the same exercise. You you have this this uh, endless amount of input and you have to of that isolate that which. Uh, sparks your interest and also which is part of this larger picture that you've been working on 
um, for, for all the other pictures that you worked before. It's not by itself. It's part of that mm -hmm. larger story. So, you know, so that's, that's cropping in various uh, levels. Yeah, it's, it's seeing the image. Yeah, basically. Yeah, the composition, and yeah, that yeah. was Peterson who Roland Peterson was yeah, the because yeah. I mean he's known for his his paintings, yeah, the thick, yeah, heavy, yeah. beautiful, luscious uh -huh. pieces. But he was yeah, he, but his you know his his composition, his geometry yeah. is a very is very, is an integral part of his of his thinking. There's more geometry than painting in there, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, in his paintings, yes, right. even figurative stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah sure. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And of course, we see that in yours. But uh -huh. I also and I know both the artists work, Peterson and. And Roland, uh, and, yeah, and then but, and, and Wayne, yeah, yeah. But when I look at Wayne's stuff too, I really in your work, I see both. I do see yeah. both images, yeah. you know. And and that's the thing, you know, artists have influences, whoever they may be. Yeah, and sometimes you get lucky. I, I was very fortunate to come to a place where uh, there were people who were doing things that I could really understand in the sense that um, I saw what they were trying to, to do because I because that's what I was trying to do too. This the, the type of geometry that you see in in Wayne's compositions mm -hmm. is pretty much something that I was struggling with with since I was a teenager. Mm. And I, now I, here I am looking at this guy. His you know his comp, he's very accomplished and he, he really worked through the, the, these problems and has had been for for years with a very acute and very sharp eye and. I was getting to hang out with him and, and taking his classes. So, uh, man, this uh -huh. is... Is that why you came to the school? Sweet. I was, no, it was completely uh, uh, accidental. Yeah. Yeah. And so you actually didn't even know him until you got there? No, I did not. Wow, that must have been a did mind blower to see But the, th the funny pieces. thing is, my first experience in the U.S. was coming in, flying into the U.S., was when I got hooked into the aerial perspectives. Because, you know, I, uh, doing urban planning is, you know... Nobody does that anymore. But when I was studying architecture, I studied. I started architecture school in 1983. There were no computers. Everything was done by hand. So when we were doing uh, topography, mm. we did literally hundreds of drawings, large, mm. as big as the stable, drawings of topography. So we were looking at all, all the terrain and trying to understand the you know the the, the you know the geometry, three dimensional geometry mm -hmm. of the land. And so it was something that I was you know was, you know mulling for years and and then i come in this guy is doing that it's like <laughs> a good fit and, and, and you said oh have, my god i could have designed this yeah. and did you get to work with him directly or just primarily take courses with wayne tebow well taking courses is what is what you did yeah yeah yeah, yeah. that and was what, what you know i've met him a few times but what kind of guy is he oh he's, he's a very thoughtful guy and uh, seems to be yeah very thoughtful and takes takes uh what we do very seriously one of one of the things that that i remember uh, of spending time with him is well, how serious he was and how much he wanted to impart that seriousness to his students in terms of uh, the fact that you are a painter, you're a professional. You're not to be, uh, not, don't, don't let yourself uh, think in terms, uh, like people sometimes think of artists. That right. They're flakes, that they're, you know, they're just doing this because it's really fun right. and I you know, <laughs> only wish I could do it too because right. it's so much fun. The well, fact of the matter is, uh, this is, you know, I'm p paraphrasing this knowledge that he was starting to impart on us. The fact of the matter is, you are as valid as, as uh, uh, a professional as uh, you're the doctor and the lawyer, of course. and 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 uh, you know any any other profession. You have a, a role to play in society, and if you don't take yourself seriously, nobody will. So you better start now, realizing that you are as valid uh, uh, a professional as anybody else. And did that wake you up when you heard that? Well, you know, that was you know, again in line with what I thought because yeah, I, you know, I, 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 I really detest uh, being called an artist. You know, I don't like that. I'm a painter, you know, and art sometimes is a result of my efforts. Mm. But a painter is what I am. I'm a professional. I work all day, and uh, you know, I, I've got this thing that I want to to accomplish. I'm building this, you know, this body of work as a professional, you know, and so that was that's how I, how I always felt. Mm. And, and and so he so sort of substantiated that uh, you know that that uh, uh, you know that way of thinking for me. Yeah, that's interesting because when I hear the word artist, I put that synonymous with painter, but you clearly do not. Well, no, no, I think I think it's it's entirely beside the point. You know, art is what I what I aim at, uh -huh. but not what I am. Uh, uh, if when things come together, you know, I. I it's a complex, a complicated concept, right? To talk about art, what's the meaning of it? What's supposed to be an artist? Well, 
you, you can go all kinds of ways. And I, I don't want to muddle the waters. So I'm a painter. I paint pictures, and I try to impart all my, my, my abilities, all my, my insights into th this, this uh, reflection of myself as a mirror and a filter of my visual reality and my society, societal experience. So I, I'm, I'm a filter, right? And uh -huh. the more I work, the, 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 the better I'll be able to, to, to grind my lenses and have a better, uh, more crystalline reflection of my, my visual experience, which is by definition unique. Since you know uh, all the synapses, all the things that are going on inside of me, cannot uh, be going on inside anybody else. So if I can really sharpen up this, these lenses, then I will provide you know a, a service that's that's honest and it's true, which is how how the world is seen through myself as, as this semi opaque. A, yeah, uh, your emotional medium. lens. Yeah, right. yeah. And do you feel that in, in every painting that when it comes out? Well, that's always the goal. Yeah, you know, yeah. and sometimes it's not all paintings are as successful as others. You know, you're always looking for that that spark that uh, is intangible that that cannot be predicted. That's right. going to make a difference. It's going to spark it. And but you know, got to be prepared to see it because that's the trick of uh, that's what takes a lifetime in painting is to be able to see things when they're there. Right. Uh, and to see them coming when they're about to come. It's really hard to predict. Yeah, that that tree is gonna do what it what it what it does like that one in the middle there. Yes, uh, you know before it happens. But you know it, you're playing, you're you're walking the tight rope. You're you're you know there's no net, uh, and you, it, it can turn out or not. Wayne Tebow, as successful as he is, he 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 torches like a third of more of what he does. Scrapes them. Oh yeah. yeah. He, he rips them and he destroys them, you know. And Not even scrapes. He actually oh, yeah. he destroys. destroys. Yeah. What he about doesn't you? want to have any chance he doesn't have any chance of it surviving uh yeah. and, you know and you know <laughs> besmirching his legacy. Right. Now I understand that. Yeah, sure. I've seen a so, lot of artists. But do the that. point is he he takes that very seriously. You know, it's it, it, he, he knows that not everything's successful. Mm. However good he's gotten at what he does, you know, he still knows that, you know, for you to continue to grow, because if you stop growing, you shrink, right? You, you stagnate. So for you to continue to grow, you have to continue to reject you, what you're doing. Mm. You, know, you, the, the, you know, it's it's, uh, it's the old thing. You know, uh, your ambition is here, and your skill set is here. If that distance is too close, then you, it's, there's a problem with ambition. If it's too distant, then you're not going to reach it. And you're going to you have a problem with skill. You're going to burn out. Ambition. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and for those who don't know, Wayne Tebow's paintings can sell for millions of dollars. Oh, so certainly. somebody to scrape or destroy a painting. Yeah, it's a serious business. That's that, a, yeah, that's yeah. making a statement. Right, absolutely. And, and he, I think it's true for any artist, whether it's a million dollars or if it's five hundred. Right, because ultimately, a yeah. day that he spends painting is a day that I spend painting is a day in our lives that uh, is being applied to that. Yeah, and all that's the asset that we have is time. That's, that's it. That's right. That is our only that's, asset. That's that's the only thing we got. Uh, yeah. So how you how, what you choose to do with it, of course. The fact that you're destroying something that was the 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 uh, the, the, the consequence of a, of a 24-hour effort is not to say that you wasted that because it's not. No, you're no, learning. You, it's what you had to do. Yeah, yeah. And what is it that usually makes you go, no, this is not going to get out? Well, um, it's just as ineffable as the success, you know. But you know when it's mm -hmm. there, uh, and sometimes <laughs> things just you know they just collapse, and you know. Uh, when you when you when you work too hard on something, it looks labored. When it looks labored, it's tiring to look at, right? Yeah. So that is something that I that is that's an easier one to spot. So when it, when it looks labored, it it, it it's, is it's painful to look at yes. because it takes more work to look at it. So that's that that right there is an easy one to spot. Can you pick the ones that really are successful? Um. Well, or does it take someone else, well, like, a, like me or a collector or someone or your wife or someone going, that one really worked? It depends on uh, your uh, definition of success. And if successful, yeah. you mean like personal success? Yes. Then absolutely. To try to predict what's going to be no. successful outside of Commercially, my, yeah, of no. my, 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 no, it can't. Uh, sometimes you can. Sometimes you bet on something and sometimes, you know, you're surprised by the, concept, by the outcome. But. Um, I try not to not to do that. I mean, it's something that you do when you begin because you, you yeah. you're eager to you know to <laughs> make get a things sale right. Too, yeah. yeah, make a sale because you know you need to buy supplies to continue doing it. Yeah. But it gets to a, it gets to a point where um, you have to have uh, enough confidence in 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 the outcome of your efforts, but 
there has to be a confidence that's born of, of, uh, of experience. And when you reach that point, when you have that confidence that's born of, of, of labor and, and, uh, and failure and accomplishment, then you can say, okay, I don't have to worry about anything else. I just focus on making sure that this is a successful, independent visual statement on its own, but also is uh, it's a part of the thread that that's been that's behind, mm -hmm. and it's going to lead me to the next thing. So it's it's connected, and it's also uh, uh, an entity that, that has its own life. So when you start, so you get your degree at Davis, I want to get to the point and find out when you get to that point where you feel like you're there. Uh -huh. But you had to go through some hurdles to get to the point where you go, I'm there, I know my who I am, I'm confident. Yeah. So what do you do after Davis? You go and start doing illustrations. So illustrations for magazines and, and web design and, and, and uh, graphic and, design. And web, web design's early there, too, fairly early. Oh, right? yeah, That's yeah, like yeah, late yeah. 80s, early 90s? Yeah, late, yeah, early 90s. Yeah. Yeah, and I was doing a lot of flash illustration you know yes uh, i do so so i was doing that because that was something that few people did so i thought okay this that'll be a niche so i did some of that it was uh, yeah and i did that and and uh, i got to a point and i in 2002 2002 i my house was paid for and we were in a situation where the the, the, the famous leap could be taken so i took the leap i pushed everything aside and i Stop doing all those things, and I just started painting. And of course, I went for two years with no income, mm. but that was 2002, and that was it. That was that's what it took uh, to just dive into it and just make it happen. Or, you know, make it. Or was it paying your house off that gave you the security? Uh, permit me, permit me to, to do that, which yes. ultimately was my my intention and need to do. You know, that was, that was how I was going to be able to, you know, to fulfill my, my dream, my, my, you know, the expectations that I have for my life. Yes. And so you were, cause you were doing very well doing the flash illustration. For oh computers, yeah. We were, clearly. You know, yeah. We're, we're, you know, we're taking care of business. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And so yeah. what was that moment, that point where you go, this is it. It's just when the house is paid off. Now I can go. I mean, was that the goal oh, that well, you set for yourself? No, it was, it was uh, September, 2001. Uh, you know, yep. 9 11. Two weeks after 9 11, I was attending a, a, with my wife. We were attending a, a wedding in in, uh, in Claremont, in, in Southern California. And my my mother in law is a painter. You know, she you know she an artist. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and, and home, it's always uh, did it. She studied that and did uh, illustrations and such. And she had a, a nice little. Uh, library of art books and i was you know spending uh, i was we were sleeping on the, on the studio uh that weekend and, and you know i pulled the book out of the shelf i started looking at it and it was a book by a portrait painter um uh, john howard senden sender senden senden a new york-based portrait painter mm -hmm. and it was you know it was a book on you know portrait painting looking at it and you know i, I had this moment where okay this is it so what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna, I'm gonna you know, gonna, first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to, uh, I'm gonna read this book from cover to cover. I'm gonna, because it was an instructional book, mm. and um, with a number of different things that worked with. But, uh, so I, I took that book home, and um, that was the day that uh, that was the end of my last career and the beginning of my, of this career. That and was part that of day. it was because do you think 9/11 pushed you over the edge? Well, I don't know. Maybe maybe there was something there in the background because it was there were those were very uncertain yes, uh, really weeks, were. right? Kind of like what we're experiencing right now. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, it wasn't consciously there, but you know maybe a little bit of that was was affecting my my uh, willingness to, uh, to make some significant radical changes in my life, but. I, I didn't have any uh, compunction because I knew that those were the things that ultimately I was gonna have to do. Uh, I was gonna do. It's just that I, I that, that was a moment where the spark was there, and I just you know I, I took the you know I, that I book, took the chance. That just, single book. That single book. Yeah, and then you know a few did months later I was hanging out with him. I met him in New York. I was gonna say, did you write the artist? Oh, I went to him. Yeah. I, yeah okay. Tell yeah. me about that. That's interesting. oh yeah. It's you know it, he was he was there with uh, a number of other. Uh, luminaries of that field I mean, this is portrait painting okay yes so you know it's a niche kind of thing but they they had this convention in new york in 2002 and i went there and i got to meet him and uh meet got to meet a bunch of other guys uh, uh, richard schmidt mm. uh, uh a number of, of those guys 
So, you know, uh, so, and, and, you know, eventually, I mean, it didn't take me long to realize that, you know, portrait painting is, is a very, very tight, difficult, complex skill. Mm. But, uh, but I, I, I wanted to be able to, move, to, to, to bring my, 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 my expression to, to other uh, fields that portrait painting would, would deny me. So it was, it was a really good way to start because you know, I have always been into painting figures mm -hmm. and portraits. Was, it, it, portrait painting is kind of a calling. Uh, either you want to do it or you don't. Mm. Uh, that's, that's the way I think of it. That's the way I see it. And it was something that from child, that's, what was, that's how I started. You know, I was mm. you know, compelled to, to draw right. you know, faces, physiognomies. I was interested in, you know, in trying to mm -hmm. reproduce physiognomies and reduce it. Uh, so, so that was an easy in for me, but I quickly pushed out of it and used uh, that skill set because you know uh, it was, and it's, it's complex in terms of uh, how you mix, you know, how you how you arrive at all those tints and how you deal with uh, with temperature and how you deal with you know with, with value and, and composition. All these things are in portrait painting. You mm -hmm. can you can become uh, a, comp a very comp a fulfilled painter, painting only portraits, I suppose. But uh, I need that engagement. I need to be uh, to be challenged intellectually, mm -hmm. uh, and and I fa I found that ultimately any me any any th theme that you choose, any uh, genre that you choose to go into, you can you can find full ful uh, find fulfillment. That's the way I, I think of it. Yeah, especially if you're successful at it. Right, and especially if you, and if you if you really uh, are ambi you know aesthetically ambitious. And you're pursuing uh, your own uh, degree of excellence. And mm -hmm. if you if you if you're challenging your own baseline, right? You don't compare yourself to anybody else. You don't compare yourself to to mm -hmm. who you were you were yesterday. And, and you realize fairly quickly within about a year that portrait painting probably wasn't it. Yeah. So I had to move on. And the question is, what what next? So uh, I ended up falling into into landscape painting because uh, it gives me. Uh, a, 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 a huge range of possibilities, uh, chromatic possibilities, compositional possibilities, uh, emotional possibilities, uh, which uh, I can I can really go out and you know, experiment and take chances and fail grand in a grand manner, right? <laughs> uh, which you know in portrait, uh, every failure is extremely painful because to be, to make a living as a portrait painting, painter, what you're doing is you're getting commissions. Yeah, failure is not an option. And hence, mediocrity uh, ensues yeah. when you cannot fail. You, you're always going to be uh, guarded and careful. Mm. And there's no place for guarded care, care in painting. I yeah. see. So, so if you're doing a portrait and you have to be paid... Um, you have to you, please... And, and you, you have to please... So everybody's, you, your own, everybody's your art director. Yeah, so if you go a little too extreme or uh, oh, if, too yeah. creative, oh, you're, yeah. you're, you may have oh, yeah. destroyed it. And right, right. so you can't right. allow yourself that... Extra creativity. So that is a, that's 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 the rub yeah. with that genre. I see that. Yeah. So unless you get to a point where you're so well known that you right. know, you're allowed the freedom. Right. 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 So if you if you are uh, uh, losing Freud, you can make right. the queen look like a prune, and yeah, that's it's right. going to be in the Buckingham Palace the next day. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's hard to get. But there's to only that. one of those yeah. losing Pro Freuds per generation. Yeah. Two, maybe. Yeah, no, there's not many, that's for yeah. sure. All right, so that's the deal. And so you said you fell into landscape. How did that happen? Well, um, I, I started working uh, uh, with galleries. And, you know, and if you, if you make a living, if you, you want to find ways to, to have your work seen, appreciated, uh, and, and, you know, and taken home, mm -hmm. you have to give them something that, you know, it's appealing, that's... Uh, that enhances somebody's uh, ex you know, domestic experience. And landscapes are n fairly neutral in that sense. In, in the East Coast, it's more possible to explore the field of portraiture mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons than it is in the West Coast. This is me, you know, and the, 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 what, what I was able to ascertain based on what I've seen. You know, uh, Californians, and I live in California, uh, are mobile people. By you know, by it's a fairly new state. I mean, yeah. before eighteen forty nine, there wasn't much going on in there. These are all people who came from other other places, from you know, from the East Coast, from other countries. And you know, when you when you, I am an immigrant, so I know how that feels. You shed your roots by by and large. I mean, you bring a lot with with you, but you have to the, the physical roots stay behind. You come you know as you as you are mm -hmm. to a new place, and that that applies to uh, your your 
cultural cultural heritage in many ways you you learn to become more flexible culturally when you move into a new place and um you know if you if you live in the east coast you live in in, in south carolina and you grew up with portraits of your of your uh, of your grandparents and the walls you can appreciate the aesthetic but you're not going to see that in california yeah people uh they, they look they look at, at that and it's, it's a little uh um, outside of their of their experience and their, their universe, um, so it's um, it's not what you're going to put on a gallery to sell portraits or try to. Cook yeah, I think that's true for the West it exists, in general. Exists, but not to the extent that will you, can, you cannot have a, an army of, of uh, professionals making a living doing that. Yeah, well, I mean, you look at wildlife art, for instance. I don't really do well with wildlife art here, but if you're in Jackson Hole and out uh-huh. that area. It sells very well. Right, so there are, yeah. Yeah, I mean, for me, landscape especially, because the desert, Uh you know, the wide open spaces, New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, Nevada, parts of California, I mean, they lend yourself to wanting to see that, not only every day, but in your artwork, at least for me. So I I agree with what you're saying. Yeah. I hadn't really thought of it in those terms, Yeah, but it it, it is true. With the landscape, you you don't, uh, you don't have to, uh, to throw everything uh, on the table, if you're gonna b- purchase purchase a landscape, mm. you, it's it, it appeals to to your aesthetics. It appeals to to who, uh, how you 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 think of yourself in terms of a consumer of of, uh, of these. Let's face it, uh, if, um, uh, uh, luxurious items, right? I yeah, mean, they it's, are. it's something that you can afford to do it, and it's gonna enhance your life. Uh, but uh, a landscape, you perfectly. Uh, able to choose that one or that one because it appeals to you. It fits uh, your expectations, and it, you think it's going to enhance your 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 life. Um, so there is it's it's an easier uh, choice to make because you, 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 if you, you know, to get a somebody to commission commission somebody to do a portrait, mm-hmm. it's an investment. It's it's a, it's a <laughs> uh, um, uh, an emotional investment that is not there. It's an easy, it's much easier to consume a landscape than mm. it is to consume a portrait. Yeah, I think that's probably true. Yeah, especially uh, portraits have all sorts of resonate. You might go, "Oh, I know a guy that looked like that," or yeah. "I don't like him for that reason," or "That person reminds me of this or that." Landscapes generally, I think, are more you get a guttural, emotional response to the land, yeah. to that area. Yeah, yeah. You know, people go to on vacations. They often want to take a landscape home because it's a place they visited. That's right. It speaks yeah. speaks to you from the outside. Yeah. It's not telling you who you are. Yes. Or challenging your self perception. Yes. It's enhancing it. It's adding to it. Right? And so, when did you? So you start doing the landscapes around two hundred two. Uh yeah, yeah, two hundred two, two hundred three. And how long did it take you to get success? Um, well, uh, by 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 two thousand and four. Uh, I, I I had a thing co- going, yeah. So you know, and was I, it in the style that you're doing today, or well, is it different? N- no, because uh, I think that six months ago <laughs> it, it was different. But you know, that's uh, the way I see it is not how somebody else would see it. But in my opinion, uh, all that I, I've always been very very hard on myself, and I, I, I my tendency is to dislike everything that I do, mm. and and I I sort of you know I encourage that because that's that's how it's always been for me. You know, I cannot I cannot do it any other way. I have to continuously challenge, and and um, I often uh, go back three or four years later and, re- and repaint a scene, and compare uh, the efforts of three years ago to where I am now. And that triangulation is is very informative because that's that tells you what you're doing, what you're not doing, and allows you to to make new leaps mm-hmm. and you you know push forward the effort. Dixon would do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he would work on paintings. Sometimes oh, I think that's extremely, five, five extre- extremely uh, uh, successful uh, strategy there. Mm-hmm. I do that a lot. And um, n- um, you know, uh, landscape is is a question of you know the, the what you learn, how you apply it, and and you know, less than the scene that you're painting. In my opinion, it's it's about the language. It's about developing a language, uh, and you know, incorporating new things to it and. Being able to understand what why things work the way they do, so that you can uh, hopefully you know apply certain you know pictorial devices to the next problem that comes your way, mm-hmm. uh, and you know and having a variety of, of choices to, to resolve problems, and that is something that there's no shortcut for that. You just need to pound that pavement for years and years and decades and decades. <laughs> and so, 
at some point you found that security in your work. Yeah. You clearly have. Well, we, well, I wouldn't call it security because I, it's always uh, important to, to have that degree of, of, uh, of, of challenge. You, know, you yes. have to constantly, uh, you, you cannot trust your, uh, um, when you're getting too, too, too pleased with your results, that's the time to stop and that's step back. That's when the back. gap is. Yeah, getting. that's time to step back. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. yeah. Can I be too glad? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Which is not to say you have to be neurotic and and, and, and so constant, constantly uh, suffering uh, bouts of, of, uh, of you know doubt. It's not about that. It's, it's about really enjoying your Mondays. You know, it's getting up in the morning, going to bed at night Sunday, and saying, "Okay, tomorrow's Monday. I got back to do it." Yeah. And when you when, when that's happening to you, then that's the right path. That's it. That's it. You know, it's to go back. And to get up, get up there, and get to get in front of that easel at 7 a.m. and work just 7 p.m. and you know, looking forward to getting up in the morning tomorrow yeah. and doing it again. It's golf, is what it is. Yeah, I don't know if you play golf, but yeah. that's what it is. Yeah. You're never satisfied, and when you get better, you want to be more better. Uh -huh. And uh, you're always looking to try to hone your skill sets. You're always trying to yeah. understand the yeah. terrain and what it's doing. It's always changing. Yeah. And um, and you you have those moments when you have a wonderful round and you go, how did I do that? Uh -huh. And you, the next day you may go in and play again and then you have a, a terrible round or it's not as good and you go, okay, I, I don't understand it. I've got to start again. I think that's kind of... Uh, do you have moments where uh, the problem that you're trying to solve in golf, like you have this one, right. uh, that something that happened that's similar to that maybe five years ago oh, yeah. comes ping Always. on your mind tick, and yes. it's right there. You have a perfect, yes. clear recall of that moment. Yep. Not oh, only do I have those, but when I play, if I do something good or bad, I'll say to myself, remember that. Uh -huh. Remember right. that moment. Oh, yeah. oh, Don't yeah. do this again. Oh, yeah. That's a mistake. You should do this. Or that's correct. That's how you should handle this situation. On that note, uh, there's one thing, interesting thing about my process. that Because when I started painting uh, professionally like this in 2002, right? I was 41 years old, right? I was, you know, I was an old dog, you know. So I... I thought to myself, okay, I'm going to start this from scratch. Well, what's the best way to do this? And, uh, you, know, you know, so I thought of all the things that I had to do. I built my studio. But one of the things that I did was I started my journal, a journal, you know, mm -hmm. work journal. So I, every single thing that I've ever done since 2002 to today, I have in my journal. Every moment that I painted, I, I absolutely religiously scrupulous about that. And it's a great, fantastic tool for me because I, I can go back to any time when that memory clicks mm. of that one thing that I did that's, ref that's, uh, that's relevant to this effort that I'm engaged in right now. Uh, I can go back and quickly see, w w get all the relevant information about that one day, that one moment, mm. how much time it took me that painting to paint, you know, and uh, what was going on in my head because, you know, it's, I, I keep track of all the, all the sessions and also... A jot down and problems and you know and, and, and joys that are, that are occurring at that moment. And do you do it at that moment when it happens? So you paint something. Sometimes something. Sometimes it's important to do it at the moment because you don't want to forget. Right. Uh, but at the end of the day, I, I I do the entries. And you always do an entry every time. Every oh yeah. And how many how many volumes do you have? Then? Oh, I have three volumes. Yeah. And how yeah. big are the volumes? Well, there there are two hundred and seventy page wow. uh, double page. Uh, journals but you know it's it's not like I, I, I write you know no essays every day you know i just it's all the relevant information uh and i also have another one um for the for the for january it's my january uh journal it's things that occur to me that i should give a shot in january january ten being the the slowest month for me so it's an up this is the month when i have an opportunity to to, to take risks that are you know on the edge of the abyss mm -hmm. right so uh whenever something occurs to me that okay i've never tried this but i'm not gonna you know jump into that right now because i don't know which way it's gonna go so it's a smaller little journal that's my you know that's my january journal and I, I make that entry in there and then the first day of january i pick that thing up and just go over all those things and see what what could i do today right and so in that journal is it Paintings that you've taken risks at throughout the year, or it's is just it... ideas that I want to implement that I want to try right. when I when I can afford the time. I see. 
Yeah. So anything that you have a great idea or an interesting idea or right. maybe just a crazy idea, right? Exactly. You'll enter it into the crazier this, the better yeah. into this journal, yeah. and then at some point when you have free time, yeah, you go. I'm going to look through it and see. Ah, this yeah. one. Yeah. That's the one what, I want to try. What can I do? What can, how can I really? I'm ready for screw this up. one. You know, how can I fail? In, you know. And how often do you do that? What? Where you pick something and do it? Oh, in January, I, I do that every January. So you do it just in the month of January? Yeah, for as much, I, not, I don't get to do it for the entire month because I yeah. got other things. January is the is the month where I will rebuild the bookshelf, yeah. okay, uh, or <laughs> make some changes to, to to the studio, but that too. And where are those paintings? Do you sell those as well, or do you hang on to well, them? Well, it depends on you know how you know how catastrophic the the, yeah. the results are, right? Or yeah. the other way, or not? You know, and I mean, sometimes they could be I got just the opposite. Yeah, and, and and those things are for my for my. Typically, I, I have this you know the the the, the loose inventory, the inventory, the stuff that I keep that I keep you know mm -hmm. that because it informs my efforts. You know, uh, having a painting that certain things were, in my opinion, opinion. Uh, excellent accomplishments for my for my baseline. Mm -hmm. So those are the ones that you want to hold on to for a while, because you can you, you can main, you know continue having this dialogue. You know, a dialogue with, a painting is a dialogue, and you know, when it's there by you, mm. uh, for me. And so sometimes it's really important that I hold on to uh, certain paintings because uh, the effort, the, the things that happen there can be duplicated. Not exactly, obviously, but they they can find their ways. Uh, into 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 problems that are that I'm continuing to, to pursue because you know there are certain things that you pursue and you go for a while that, mm -hmm. you, that you you know you, you and then you move on to other things and sometimes those things tend to to, to go for a few months uh, certain things that you're pursuing like uh, uh, on occasion I, uh, I want to understand the relationship between uh, warm and cool colors on, on the high key mm -hmm. what can I do that uh, with that and how can I contrast high key to low key uh, on the on the lights and on the darks and how can I how can I control uh, the opacity of, of the, the darks how, how opaque can I get away with doing the darks because mm. you know mm -hmm. traditionally you want the darks to be as transparent as possible right mm -hmm. but you know you can key your darks anywhere you want as you key as you begin to key your your darks higher up which is trickier the higher the darks are keyed the, the more difficult it is for you to pull them off as darks, uh, the more opaque they have to be, and so that's you know it's a relationship between that and what surrounds it. You know, it's adjacent lighter fields that will bring together a, a picture that 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 has its proper distribution of of, of late weights. Mm -hmm. So you know, so that sometimes is an effort that I'm engaged in more than other things. So, is it usually more of a color issue? That's your heart, the thing that you have to work on the most color shadow versus composition actual composition well yeah I, I, the way i think of it for me and i've developed this way of thinking over the years is uh, it's akin to having the, the plates in the air it's uh it's various uh, dimensions various layers so for me the, that painting uh is uh, is serving the the needs of various layers. Uh, I've got the temperature layer, I've got the composition layer, mm -hmm. right? The formal composition layer that's mm -hmm. fundamental. Uh, that's that's been that slapped into the lattice of that grid that, that I always have in there. Mm -hmm. And if you start looking at the paintings, you're gonna see that the, the moments in which the, the it snaps to the grid to, to bring a, a parlance of computer into into the stock here. Mm. Uh, but um, so the composition is one layer. The, the the value distribution that's a layer and uh, the chromatic composition is a layer you know where the green the greens the yellows and the blues mm. and, and are right now the temperature composition is a layer the uh, the key is a layer the opacity of those dark circles are, so the more you parse that the more you separate those things in your mind and the, uh, the more sophisticated you have the opportunity to make them them express themselves. Mm. Uh, that's for me. So I have those things. Um, I make a real, real s honest effort to think of those things separately uh, and when I'm composing mm. and when I'm executing the composition. So uh, when you're painting, you go, okay, this has to do with this specific right, layer, right, period. Right, right. I'm and, not thinking about anything else. Right, and then there, and then there's there's uh, uh, calligraphy. That's that's a composition. That's a layer. Calligraphy is a layer. And if you look at uh, it's it's the wrist, and it's, it's how you go about. Uh, allowing the, the, the those movements to, to be part of the message. To me, that's the voice. You could call it that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, when I see your paintings, I can tell your paintings from anywhere because right. you have so a that's specific the wrist. Yeah. 
way that you lay down the paint and it has a certain right. sensibility. Yeah. Your, your inner voice, yeah. which is what I always look for in an artist. Do they have an original voice? Right. You call calligraphy. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. What about those journals? What's going to happen to them? What's going to happen to them? Mm, yeah. Well, it's, as it's far as as long as I'm alive, they're going to be my 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 tool. After right. that, it doesn't really matter. Right? Well, it does matter to me. It doesn't. But to other people, it might matter. <laughs> well, yeah. tremendously. Yeah, but not, I don't have time to think about what's going to happen then. Right now, I'm I'm too busy trying to think of what's going to happen now. So right? they're really just for you. You don't see them in a as a long term statement. Well, yeah, I don't. I don't. Painter. Right. I don't. I don't go about writing uh, obscenities in there because I I could I could drop dead tomorrow and then <laughs> you know. Uh, so you know, I, I'm kind of you have that in the back of your mind, right? But it's it's a tool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it's a it's a it's a tool that I really respect, and um, I'm very very fortunate that it occurred to me to do it. And once I started doing it, it's not, I don't feel like my own hero that I do it because it's unavoidable. Yeah, you know? it's part of the process. But yeah, right? it's absolutely part of the process, and I cannot, you know, I can't, I can't get f very far away from from those. Do you know things. of other artists that do that? No, I, I've never. Is, I don't is, know of any. This is something that I that that I did on my did on my own. I wasn't like I oh uh, yeah no. Right. It was something okay. I. I sat down really uh, when I was building my studio and I was thinking of all those charts of colors. One of the things that I did first summer, um, I, I spent an entire summer uh, painting charts. Uh, uh, that I learned from uh, Richard Schmidt. Mm. And, you know, and right. uh, so I painted his color charts with his, his uh, palette. And I spent a whole summer, I spent three months painting little squares of paint. And that was an incredibly uh, uh, you know, enlightening experience for me. It seems like a horribly boring way of spending the summer, uh, and in a sense it is because you're there and you're not doing anything that's you know uh, relevant to anything else but that. But you know it was a way of really getting into the into the palette. Yeah, it's writing the words on the paper. Right. I mean, yeah. as an author, that's what I see. And I have those those boards. I, I every once in a while I pull them out to to see okay, what's going to happen here when I get this this cadmium lemon and, and this viridian viridian at this one degree of of tint. Mm. And I've got it there. You know, I can just pull it out and think, oh, yeah, mm. that right there. And then, man, that's what I want. Oh, maybe not. Maybe it's, I should go with it with the, you know, with the Academy Yellow Deep. Do you find that your paintings come together uh, faster now that you can paint them faster? Or is it still really laborious? No, it cannot be laborious. I mean, my, my, my success is, and again, when I speak of success, I'm always talking about how it, what it means to me. Correct. Right? My successes are always uh, the things that happen uh, effortlessly. Mm. Yeah, With the, uh, in painting, when I'm composing, I take all the time in the world, and sometimes I take more more time composing than I do painting. Mm. You know, my composition is something that I, I I start with the idea, and then I then I have a sketch, and then I I will have increasingly larger pads in which I, I will charcoal compose mm -hmm. until I end up with typically a. a 18 by 24 format, mm. and I grid that, and I and I do the final composition, and then I grid the the the, the canvas, and then I'll begin to to transfer the larger passages and find opportunities for enhancement uh, in in the final composition. But the composition, I, you know, I could I, I could just stop right there because mm. the work is pretty much, you know, a good deal of it is already you know accomplished. That's the hard lifting. Yeah, right. It is. And are smaller or medium or larger. Easier or not, size paintings. Well, just economically, um, just for you as an artist, the, to do, the or large, a the larger things don't don't take that much more. It's uh, if you were working on on a on a um, ten by twenty, mm. it's it's not four times as as much work as working on a on a five by ten. Yeah, you know, it's five four times the area, but it's not four times the effort. Right. It's maybe one and a half times the effort. So you can work on any size, and it's. It, uh, it it translates well for you. Yeah, yeah. Of course, uh, scale is part of the message as well. So yeah, you, you cannot expect to just pick that thing up and blow it to a, to a, a, f a twelve by six. Right. I mean, you know, changes will have to be made in color and composition and a variety of things for it to look the same, if you mm -hmm. will. You know, uh, because um, you know a large thing is perceived differently. You know, it's, it's our apparatus will read it differently. It's unavoidable. It's not even just aesthetically, it's, you know, it's physiological. So where you started, when you started back in 92, uh, 2002, 2002 yeah. uh, to now, what's the change? How, where are you today compared to there? 
Well, um, basically, you know, again, I'm always talking about how I think, see things. It's you know, I I give myself just a preamble here. I give myself the right to be completely uh, bonkers because mm -hmm. I don't I don't I don't develop solutions for anybody but myself. Yeah. So all my solutions are perfect because they don't apply to anybody else for me but me. If they apply to me, then I'm good. Right. Right. So um, um, for me, the, the development. My development, the way I see it, is I'm just trying to pull things that have always been there, and it's I, I'm learning to see them for what they are, and extract and and uh, use them, because I'm I'm I have more experience. I was able to more clearly see those things, and to me they've always been there. I spent uh, I, when I was 17, between 16 and 18, I did literally tens of thousands of drawings. I, I drew constantly, nonstop. And th these were all um, largely, um, not exact ab exactly abstract, but there was a lot of abstraction in, in depicting uh, reality. Mm. So it was, it was a, a, a stream of consciousness uh, drawing effort that was, that was like a constant. It was a wake I was doing it. Um, and I knew that those things were extremely useful, and I don't know exactly how they were going to be useful. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, Forty years later, I find myself uh, arriving at solutions such as the figures that you see uh, in that uh, in, in that landscape in there, which are a result of those experiments that I had when I was doing those things when I was seventeen. Mm. So uh, when I say, when you ask me where I am now mm -hmm. as compared to two thousand and two, uh, I'm exactly the same person, except that I, I have a clearer vision of who that person is, and I'm take, making better use of the uh, of the the innate. Uh, attributes that came with the package, so I'm able to kind of pull it out and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, more efficient at using those things. You understand yourself better. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I think we all do that, whether yeah. it's yeah. you know painting or writing or just in our daily, you know, the way we deal with other people. Yeah, yeah. You know? and you know, and, and, and of course, you cannot uh, deny exposure as as a, a source of 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 course of growth so you've got to be able to open to open up and steal from the rich you got to find that stuff in other people that 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 you find to be accomplished accompli an accomplishment that fits with your uh trip your your pursuits and incorporate that uh and of course there's a fine line between incorporating something and redoing it right right and uh, redoing it, what's the point of that but incorporating absolutely free game everybody did it everybody does it you know the best became the best because they did it yeah they looked so, and they absorbed and right. then they made it theirs that's right you yeah. learn now do you still go to brazil and do you paint there at all yeah oh yeah yeah because sure. you also have some european shows i know you had one this last year yeah, yeah. and how do you find the market there versus here well, uh, they they came to me and because uh, they found something in, in the work that they found to be of appeal to them Compelling. and to and to their and to, the, to their circle, and it's been good. I mean, uh, we've had good results last year at my first show, my first solo show in, in Holland uh, in August, and it, we did good sales. Mm. Uh, and it's the Benelux. It's it's a it's a it's a market that's uh, sort of a, a it's, they they're careful. Uh, it, it, with uh, purchasing, they they want to see uh, somebody for a couple of years before they. You know, I'm talking about the collectors mm -hmm. before they 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 commit, and uh, so I was prepared to, you know, to whether you know get blanked. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but that's that wasn't the case. And yeah. I, I had sold more than half of what I had there. Wow, and that was in Holland. Yeah. And so, assuming that we can travel again, you're going to do that right. again. Assuming that, that there'll be a yeah, I was going to. And my plan was to go back in August now. Yeah. Uh, but now, you know, right now, we're, everything is up in, in the air. Yeah, how does that affect you as an artist? I mean, we're all affected, but, I mean, you depend on other people primarily to sell your work. That's right. Yeah. Well, um, fortunately, I'm in a situation where I, you know, I'm, I'm okay, yeah. uh, and I just... You own your house. I own mm -hmm. my house, I own my studio, and nothing's going to change. I got, I got supplies and materials to last me two years in the studio built up. Yes. So even if I were... Uh, complete without an income right now, you know. Uh, it, I'll just continue doing exactly what I'm doing. You which think is not it'll the case, but, uh, interfere in a way with your creativity at all? Well, uh, in a sense, there's, there's a certain liberating aspect to, to when there are, the expectations have changed when uh, 
you, you you know the the amount of hours that you have ahead of you is exactly the same as the amount of hours that you had behind you, given the same number of days. Mm-hmm. Uh, but now, uh, if there won't be a show or two shows or three shows or four shows to 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 populate, mm-hmm. but you're still going to continue paying the same amount. Mm-hmm. There's a certain liberating aspect to that, mm-hmm. that that it's kind of lingering. I'm I'm very reluctant to to give into that uh, to to that thought because i don't want to be complacent but um, you will never be complacent but Del. but you know i can uh, tell that yeah. right now but my point is um it's sort of exhilarating yeah. uh, I'm, I'm, I'm taking that exhilaration with a, with a grain of salt yeah. that's what i mean but there is certain there is a certain giddiness about what's going to happen and of course what am i saying right people are suffering this is serious what we're going through right now but uh, you know, uh, I was looking at the chart, the New York Times of activities in time versus exposure, yes. and it's a you know it's a it's a an X and Y kind of kind of yes. curve, and I have all these dots. You know, up here on the very top right is dental hygienists, mm-hmm. right, and on the bottom r- left is loggers, and right next to loggers is Art. fine artists, yeah. because these are the guys, the people. Uh, who are completely Isolation. isolated by themselves, and that's that's how I spend my life, you know. And I have no problem. With that. I love it because it's that's the that's the environment that I need in order to be able to negotiate all these all these issues. Um, but so that's not going to change, and I'm going to be doing exactly the same thing. I I'm here with you right now, and uh, because I you know it's what we we want to do. But that's a small part of my of my of my working year. Right. You know, I'm there working 10, 12 hour days, six days a week. Every week of my year, yeah, and, you know, and I take maybe a, two weeks out of that whole year to do these things that I'm doing. Yeah. Like right now. Well, it's interesting. Dixon did the same thing. So during the Great Depression, you know, in about a five-year period, he only sold like 24 paintings. Uh-huh. And so what does he do? He goes to Taos Pueblo, a place he really kind of always wanted to spend time, and he spends seven months there. Uh, because he has the freedom, because he knows he's not going to sell, yeah. right? Right, right. And he just wants to paint. He wants to experience. So and he does some of his greatest work. That's what I was going to say. In that's... that period of time, yep. Not expecting to sell any of them. Uh-huh. Uh huh. So I can understand from an artist's point of view that if you your expectations are low for sales, yeah, uh, you're in a position where you've got enough to survive. That it gives you that maybe that moment you can go. Well, let me explore some things that. Maybe I normally wouldn't do, but I I want to hit my January, yeah, you know, yeah. log it's in be a January, you know, longer January. in May. Yeah, it's yeah. going to be a longer January. When the pantry is full, you can take chances. Yeah, right. So you know, I, my belly is full, and uh, I I have no choice but to continue doing what I'm doing because this is, this is my life. I'm yeah, going that's to, what you do. Yeah, my my retirement plan is to, is to croak at the easel. Yeah, uh, you know, and so I'm going to continue doing exactly what I'm doing, and, and you know. That's it. Yeah, I think that's all any of us can yeah, do. Yeah, quite frankly, yeah. what else is there for all the people that might I feel be very fortunate. To that? Yeah, I feel very fortunate that I found a place in in this in this universe that uh, allows me to to live the life that I do because that's the that's the gig that I, of my dreams, you know. And it took me a long time to to find the place and you know hold on to it. And it's it's great. So it's fun do you, to be do you have advice for artists that are thinking about you know I want to become a painter and do this? Well, if you really if that's what you want to do, there's only one way of doing it: is to just give it, give your all. Mm-hmm. And if you can, if you can eat, and if you're committed, eventually the results will speak for themselves. Mm-hmm. And there is, there's no shortcuts. There's no silver bullet. There's only work. There's only work and determination, and you have to be stubborn. And and that's it. Yes. Yeah. It's a uh-huh. stubborn, healthy stubbornness. Yeah, healthy. Well, I think maybe we'll leave it on healthy stubbornness. Yeah. yeah, very interesting. I can see, you know, after talking to you for this period of time, I understand your paintings better. Good. Um, because I see the way you look at life and the way that you're very um, concise about how you look at things. And that really shows in your paintings. Um and I, when I say concise, I don't mean in a, in a way that it's um, realistic. It's, it's you coming through the paintings is what it is. You know, when I, I think anybody who's interested in one of your paintings should go listen to this podcast. I think we'll have a better insight of what, you, what goes mm-hmm. through the process for you to make that beautiful piece of art, which I love. I mean, I love your paintings. Well, I have one in my bedroom that I mm-hmm. look at. 
Um, when, and now you brought all these other ones. I'm afraid I may have another one in my bedroom. <laughs> Don't be afraid. <laughs> I'm never afraid to buy art. And neither should you out yeah. there listening. Oh, yeah. Never be afraid to buy art because it provides something to the soul that you can't get from any other place. Yeah. And, and I speak, speaking for myself, I, I have, you know, my, uh, every vertical space in my house taken up by paintings. And it, it's a constant exchange of information between me and them and i pass by and every every moment of double take will get will feed me feed my day you know yeah. I, i'm looking at paintings of myself and other people's yeah sure and it's it's a it's just it really enriches one's life well del alameda thank you so much normally we'd shake hands but we're not doing that anymore no, we're not. yeah and we may not yeah, be for a very long yeah, time right. but we're still going to be making art we're still going to be creating and I'm going to still be doing our dealer diaries. And thank you very much, Mark, for, ha yeah. for having me and for uh, Great. putting the works on the walls. Let's go look at the rest of the art that you brought in. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Uh -huh. Excellent. All right. Great. That was very fun. Good, good. We need your support for the Medicine Man Gallery channel, so make sure to click the subscribe button and tap the little bell icon to be notified when we upload a new video, which we do every morning on Wednesday and Friday. See you soon. Thank <laughs> you.